Good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that time together, connecting in those prayer groups. Um, those are just real special moments, I think. There's something about gathering together, getting to know a few people, and knowing what's going on in each other's lives. So not only do you take that time and pray for one another when you're together, but when you leave this place, thinking about one another. I mean, the church is supposed to be a body that's connected, one body made up of many parts, and, and it's relational. Um, disciples and, ma and making disciples is something that's built on relationship. When we see how Jesus walked with his disciples, that's what it was all about. Um, so all that to say, we have a short window now for our teaching. I'm going to try to keep us on track and on time, so we might not get through as much as I would like, but that's okay. I'll gladly sacrifice some of this time for that time. Um, but we are starting the second part of our series. We're going into the book of Second Peter. If you're new here, we like to teach through books of the Bible. We just th went through First Peter, and uh, we're going to start in Peter's second letter. These are Letters that he wrote generally to the church, okay, so it's not to a specific area or a specific uh, situation where they were asking questions like you find in some of the, some of the other letters, like Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Um, <clears throat> Peter is writing to encourage believers. Now, in 1 Peter, he was writing specifically to people who had gotten scattered as a result of persecution. He's addressing issues among believers where they're, they're experiencing uh, difficulty from the outside. There's persecution, there's struggle, um, they're facing many trials. Now, in 2 Peter, he kind of shifts a little bit. He's dealing with issues within the church. So he's talking about things like um, growing in our faith. He's talking about deception and struggle that comes from within when people teach false teachings. And so uh, we'll see that unfold in the, in the coming weeks. So today, as we get into the very beginning of 2 Peter, we'll see that he's, he's talking about spiritual growth, okay? And this is something that should interest all of us. And I'll just ask you a simple question to start. Do you want to grow in your relationship with God? Do you desire to take that next step and grow in your relationship with God? If you do, then I want to encourage you to listen to what Peter has to say this morning. We're going to start in 2 Peter, starting in verse 1, we're just going to read four verses begins, he says, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. All right, let's pray. God, in the short time that we have together, I pray that you would just speak to us from your word. Give us wisdom. Lord, help us to take that next step in our growth, in our relationship with you, whatever that means for each one of us. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts as only you can. Help us to have ears to listen, hearts that are open. And we love you and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verse 1. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior. All right, so Peter starts off and he identifies himself as a slave or servant of Christ. Slave and apostle in that order. And, and that's important because as he talked about in 1 Peter, those who lead in God's church should be those who first serve. He wrote as an elder to other elders, and he encouraged the elders, be humble, follow Jesus, live like Jesus. He was a servant, even though he was God in the flesh walking the earth. He served and loved the people around him. And so when Peter identifies himself, he says, a servant and apostle, okay? So those who lead in God's church must first be those who serve. If you want to lead God's people, 
you have to be willing to serve God's people, okay? The word minister, when you hear someone called a minister, the word minister in the Greek literally means servant. And so Paul says, I mean, he kind of takes it to the next, next level. He says, I'm a slave of Christ, or some translations say a bond servant. I'm his. I'm following Jesus first and foremost. Now he says, I'm writing to you, this is interesting, I'm writing to you who share this same precious faith that we have. And he's writing to Christians, okay? He's writing to the people of that time, everyone who would read it afterwards. I'm writing to you. Who, say the, who share the same precious faith that we have. Have you thought about that? You share the same faith that the apostles had. I share the same faith that those who walked with Jesus had. When you put your faith in Jesus, your life changes. You receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. You receive the Holy Spirit as the scripture says, you're once dead in your sin, you become alive or born again. There's a change that takes place. The same Holy Spirit that works in your life is the same Holy Spirit that worked in Peter's life. It's the same Holy Spirit that the scripture says raised Jesus from the dead. Just think about that. You know, we share the same faith as the apostles. Now, to be fair, there's things that they experienced that we didn't. They walked physically with Jesus, right? Right? We walk metaphorically with Jesus, but we share the same, the same faith that they have, which is really amazing when you think about it. And he's going to talk more about what it means to grow in that faith. And it says that this faith was extended to us, not because of who we are or what we've done, anything special about us. It says it was extended to us because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. This faith is extended to anyone and everyone who would receive it, right? John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, right? Everybody is invited in to receive this faith. It's because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting the words that Peter chooses here, Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. So make no mistake about it. The Bible clearly teaches us that Jesus himself claimed to be God. The apostles knew him as not only Savior, but Lord and God, as Peter says right here. If you want to know more about God's character, God's disposition toward you, you want to know more about how God responds in situations, learn more about Jesus. You know, I often say that, I mean, read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, read the Gospels, because when you look at the life of Jesus and you see how Jesus lived and how he interacted with people, you see the heart of God. You know, a lot of people get really hung up with some of the Old Testament and just struggle with, man, why, how did this happen? And Scripture's really clear. In Jesus, we see the deity in bodily form, fullness of God. You want to know the heart of God? Look at the heart of Jesus. Look at the life of Jesus. Now, verse 2, Peter says, <clears throat> May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. May God give you more and more grace and peace. Grace literally means favor or goodwill. May God give you more and more favor. May his goodness be with you in abundance as you grow in knowledge of him. May he give you peace, more and more grace, more and more peace. Peace is freedom from worry, freedom from anxiety. Anybody use a dose of that this morning? I think we all can, right? But he goes, this will happen as you grow more and more in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. May God give you more and more grace as you grow in the knowledge of God. Now, I want to make sure we understand when he says growing in the knowledge of God, he's not just talking about reading the Bible and having head knowledge of, about God. He's talking about growing in knowledge of God, understanding God, but also knowing God, like really knowing him, walking with him, not physically as the disciples did, but daily interacting with him, speaking to him and believing that he wants to speak to you. 
that by his spirit, he interacts with us. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. The title of the series is Exiles, Living in a World that is Not Our Home. We're a new creation in Christ. We were created to be with God. After the garden, everything changed, right? Sin enters the world. Sin, death, disease, struggle, pain, all come into the world. But we were still created to be with God, and that's where we will all be one day who have our faith in Jesus. This past week, uh, one of our, our dear members here, Susan Hundley, went to be with the Lord on Wednesday. I think it was Wednesday. And uh, she battled with COVID and COVID pneumonia. And, um, you know, it's always difficult, heartbreaking when someone leaves this world who we love, Right? Even if we know they're a person of faith and we know where they're going to be, there's still this, this heartbreak because the distance that we have, they're no longer here with us, but they're with the Lord. That's the promise that we have, right? And the reality is what Peter's trying to do, and as we read the scriptures, what, what all of the disciples are trying to do is prepare us to walk with God today, to grow in our relationship with him so that we're prepared for whenever that day comes our way. Because there's that one guarantee in life, right? People say two, death and taxes, but we know people who cheat on their taxes, right? So it's not, there's not two, there's one, and it's that we're going to all breathe our last breath and ultimately be with him. And so this is to prepare us to help us grow in our knowledge of him and knowing him. And when we do, then we can rejoice even in those most difficult times because we truly know where those people we love, where they are, and that we will be with them reunited with God as God desired, free from all this pain, struggle, and sin that we experience this side of heaven. So, are you where you want to be in your relationship with God? Do you desire to grow in your relationship with God? It's important to understand that where you are in your walk with God really has a lot or almost everything to do with you. You know, it's not something we can put off on someone else. It's really up to you how much you will grow. Spiritual growth has nothing to do with your age. Okay, just because you're older doesn't mean you're mature. And all the parents of teenagers said, amen, right? Just because they go from 12 to 15 doesn't mean they get more mature. Well, just because you've gone from 30 to 50 doesn't mean you're more mature in the Lord either. I believe it was Spurgeon who said, there are children in the church of God who are 70 years old. And the reality is we'll grow as much as we want to grow because everything that's been given to us for our spiritual growth has been provided by God. Look at what Peter says in, in verse 3. By his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. By his divine power, all right, he has given us some of what we need. No, he's given us what? Everything we need for living a godly life. It's by his divine power. There's no power greater in the universe than the one who spoke it all into existence. And it's by his power we've been given everything we need to live a life for him. And you know what that means? That means there's no more room for excuses. You know? It's really, you know, you can say, yeah, we left that church because uh, I wasn't being fed. Okay, I, and I get that, right? I'm a little defensive because I'm a pastor, okay? But, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get that. But if your 15-year-old goes, man, I, I'm moving out because I'm just not being fed. I mean... I'm going, listen, dude, there's, there's food in the refrigerator. I mean, you've been off the, you know, for a long time, and I'm not spoon feeding you anymore. I mean, I say all that to just simply say this. Here, listen. <laughs> you thought I was going to say it, right? But, okay. You have, you have the meat. I mean, you probably have multiple copies of this in your home. If not, free Bibles out on the counter, free Bibles out on the stand in there. You have everything you need for life and godliness given to you by the Holy Spirit, and we have God's 
precious promises that he, Peter talks about, right? And this is what helps us grow. So if you really truly want to grow in your relationship with God, it starts with this. Look in the mirror. You don't have to look in the mirror, but metaphorically, just look, look at your life and ask yourself the question, am I where I want to be in my walk with God? And then the second part of that is, what do I need to do to take that next step? What do I need to start saying yes to? What do I need to start saying no to? And saying, God, by your spirit, help me to do it because I can't do it on my own. I need you. It's by his divine power that we can change. So we're living as exiles in this world. We're waiting to go back to be with God. That's where we'll ultimately be. We'll be home with him. In the meantime, we should be growing in our knowledge of him and understanding of him. And as we do that, we'll experience more and more grace, more and more peace. His peace will be on us. His favor will be with us. And that's what Peter says. Now look at verses three through five. We've received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. All right, so everything we're talking about this morning are blessings we've received because of our relationship with Jesus. He called us to himself. We receive grace and peace and abundance because of, because of his grace, because of his love. And we grow in our knowledge of God. And we all have the ability to do that. If you can read, you can understand the promises of God. We share the same precious faith and the same precious promises that the apostles shared. We have this divine power working in us that will help us have everything we need for life and godliness. Everything. Now, Peter, he takes it a step further here. He talks about these precious promises that we have. And these promises help us to be sharers or partakers in the divine nature. All right, that sounds a little bit crazy. I'm going to try to unpack it a little bit for you. But first, I want to just say this. The promises of God a couple things about the promises of God. Because he says we share in the promises of God. The, the promises they shared in, we share in. Three things about the promises of God. Quick, real quick, I want to say. Number one, they're abundant. I was going to say the promises of God are countless, but they're not countless, right? Some guy actually went through and tried to count all the promises of God in the Bible. And he came up with 8,810 promises of God. So they're not countless, but if you were to try to read all the promises of God and stand on all the promises of God, it would take you a lifetime. The promises of God are abundant, and the promises of God are dependable because the one who made the promise is trustworthy. Hebrews 10, 23 says this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. God is trustworthy. You can trust the promises of God. They're abundant. They're dependable. And lastly, they're essential. They're an essential part of our relationship with God. They're a part of the knowledge that Peter talked about earlier, and he says, you know, the more you know him, you'll grow in these things, grace and peace. And the more you know him and know his promises, the, the closer you will walk with him. They show God's character. They remind us that we're his children. Let me just read off a couple promises, just a couple from the scripture to think about. Romans 10, 9, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise. What do you need to do according to this to be saved? Declare Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. It's not about how good you are. It's not about where you've been. It's not about how holy you are. It's about what you believe. 
That's a promise. 1 John 1, 9, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. You confess to him, he forgives you. That means for some of us who've been confessing the same, same sin for five years, stop. Because what it's doing is showing your lack of faith. He loves you and he forgives you. Now, if you're still doing that sin five years later, yeah, confess it because <laughs> you did it yesterday. I'm talking about the thing that you're going, you know, that the devil reminds you of, of who you once were. If that's who you once were and you're not that person any longer and that's already been confessed to God, then believe God's promises and walk in his promises. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, come to me, all you, are, you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. That's a promise. I'm not going to throw more burden on you. I'm going to give you rest, Jesus said. Hebrews 13, 5, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I'll never fail you. I'll never abandon you. You don't have to keep running after more and more and more and more. I'll take care of you, he said. That's the promise. Love him. Use money to do what you need to do. But love him first. Don't love money and try to use God to get more. Romans 8, 38, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. That's a promise. You might feel distant at times. Hold on to these promises. Draw closer to him. Nothing can separate you from God's love. If there's any separation that takes place, it's from me pulling back in that relationship with him. But it will not separate me from his eternal love that he has for me. All right. Start to land the plane here. 2 Peter 1, 4 and 5, just to kind of finish up this passage. He says, and because of his glory and excellence, he's given us great and precious promises these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. These promises allow you, enable you to share his divine nature. Okay, now that sounds a little bit crazy that you can share in the divinity in some way in the divine nature of God. But that's what the scripture says. What does that mean? Are you God? Look at your spouse or the person sitting next to you, and they will assure you that you are not, right? Okay? We all still sin and we fail no matter how close we are in our relationship with God. No, that's not what he's saying. But you share. You're a partaker in the divine nature. The nature of God is in you somehow. What does he mean? When you put your faith in Jesus, you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in, changes you from the inside out. You're born again. You're a new person. You go from death to life. You are now a child of God. And as a child of God, you are a partaker of God's divine nature. He lives in us by his spirit. It's throughout the scripture. It's undeniable. Paul says it's, it is... Uh, not I who live, but Christ who lives in me now. He says, it is Christ in us that is our hope of glory. He says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. We are partakers of the divine nature. The promises of God remind us of that because Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come and would do those very things and would change us from the inside out. And that's a promise for everyone. Ephesians 1:13. and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Don't ever let anyone tell you that being a Christian means believing in a historical Jesus who lived one day and died for the sins of the world, or that it's about reading a book and and. and trying to do all these things you should do and not do the things you shouldn't do. That's not what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means to put your faith in Jesus, who wasn't some historical figure. Yes, he lived 2,000 years ago. He died, he rose from the dead. 
He was alive. He ascended into heaven where the scripture says he sits at the right hand of the Father. So it's faith in a God who's alive. It's faith in Jesus who's alive. And because he's alive, he has life to give. And when you put your faith in him, he gives you a spirit. Now all of a sudden, you're woke as can be. I mean, it's a new world that you see. I mean, you see things differently. You see, or at least you should see people differently. The church is people from all different walks of life, beliefs, backgrounds, colors coming together and walking together in Jesus. Why? Because you're a partaker of the divine nature, the spirits in you. I'm a partaker of the divine nature, the spirits in me. We're brothers and sisters. It goes deeper than blood. That's what it means to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus. He's given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything. So, why don't you? <laughs> why don't I? At times, right? Because I, mean, I can sit there and preach all that. It sounds so good. Yeah, preach it. We're a new creation. Man, we're going to take on the world. And then you leave here, you get a fight on the way home, yell at your kid, sin in some other way, the guy cuts you off and give him the one finger salute, all those things, right? They happen. It's real. How can that happen if I'm a partaker of the divine nature of God's living in me? Because the old nature hasn't disappeared. If my old nature disappeared, then I would be like God. But no, there's this battle that goes on. So there's this old nature that the scripture says you're supposed to die to that nature. You got to continue to crucify that nature. You have to feed the new nature. You know, what you feed is going to grow. If you're feeding your old nature and your old life with worldly stuff, then you're going to become more worldly. If you're feeding the new nature with the things of God, the promises of God, you're going to grow in your knowledge of him. You're going to grow in grace. You're going to grow in all the things that Peter says you'll grow in. But I just want to say this, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up with this. And, and you guys can come on up, Levi. Um, Paul, who had one of the most dramatic conversion experiences you could ever imagine. He was a persecutor of the church. He, he, if he didn't kill Christians himself, he certainly um, approved of it. He was throwing them in prison. I mean, he was fighting against God. He has this encounter with Jesus. He's radically changed. Everything I just talked about happened to him. He was given new life. And now he is the greatest spokesman and evangelist for the faith and for this Jesus who he is persecuting. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament. God uses them powerfully. Yet, Paul writes this, Romans 7, verses 18 to 20. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. There's still this other nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I, want to do, I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. Drop down to verse 24. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. So he's having this internal struggle, this battle between the divine nature, the sinful nature, serving God, and obeying God, and, and giving in to sin. And so I just want to say, it's a daily struggle. And we have to feed the divine nature. We need to, you know, we need to feed our soul. But it's not just reading, and it's not just you and God. It's the people around you. It's being encouraged by one another. We read in the book of Acts, it talks about the church encouraging one another. We're supposed to spur one another on to love and good deeds. It's you know, it, it takes all of us together as the family of God, like I talked about earlier. So that battle will go on. It will go on until the end. But here's the thing he says. Who will save us? Who will rescue us from this body of death? Jesus Christ. So because you've come into faith, come to faith in Christ and you receive the Holy Spirit, you're changed, your, your sin is cleansed, you're a new person. Let me just say this. You still need Jesus. Paul knew that, like, I still need Jesus. I need Jesus today as much as I needed Jesus 22 years ago to save me. I need Jesus. And I need Jesus to help me. I need his spirit to fill me. I need him to strengthen me. 
I need him to forgive me. And so here's how Paul ends that whole struggle. He talks about the struggle in chapter 7. This battle, I don't do what I want to do. I'm doing the things I don't want to do. And then Romans 8, 1, and this is what I want to leave you with. And if you'll stand with me, we're going to close in this last song in just a minute, but I want to pray for us. So after he talks about that great struggle, the spiritual battle, this is what he says. And this is the reminder for all of you sinners out there. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. God, I pray that you would remind us of this. We confess we're sinners. We, we battle just as Paul describes. We can all relate to that in different ways. So we just throw ourselves at your feet, Jesus. And we confess our need for you. And we thank you for that reminder in Romans 8.1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, there is no condemnation if you are in Christ. Come to him, you'll be forgiven. Come to him, if you've never put your faith in him, put your faith in him, you will be saved. Come to him, you will receive new life. And so that's the invitation. As we sing this song, I want to encourage you just to come to him. And you don't need to come out of your chair or anything like that. There's nothing special about any altar, so to speak. But come to the altar of your heart. Lay down your life and receive all that he has. That's the invitation. Let's worship together.